The top two US Open title favorites, Arena Sabalenka and Igor Skiantek, are safely into the quarterfinals, but things are bound to get a lot tougher as both women have stern tests waiting for them. Can Sabalenka avoid a revenge ploy from the reigning Olympic gold medalist Ken Wen Zheng? And will Skiantek cool down the red hot Jessica Pagula in front of the pro Pagula New York crowd? Today, I've enlisted the help of Miles David of the Tune Into Tennis podcast to help me break down and predict the outcomes for all four women's quarterfinals at the U.S. Open. Hello, my name is Christian Bassnight, and welcome to Christian's Court, where I cover tennis from all angles. If you have not yet already, make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post more U.S. Open updates and content throughout the tournament. It's U.S. Open quarterfinals time, and for this preview slash prediction, I wanted to do something a little bit different and let someone else face the heat for making predictions and today that person is my good friend miles david of tune into tennis miles is very active on x formerly known as twitter and he often hosts nighttime spaces giving tennis fans a nice outlet to chop it up about their beloved sport he also has a podcast the tune into tennis podcast which you can listen to wherever you get your podcast and he also does streams on youtube for his channel miles david tune into tennis and he posts other tennis related videos so make sure you subscribe to his channel but without further ado i'm gonna let the man introduce himself welcome to christian's court miles hey christian i am glad to be on the court with you uh it's Hopefully it's a good, uh, amicable time. Maybe like Shelton Tiafo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking about, you know, the Open, before we start our giving our pr predictions and previews, what are your thoughts on all the tennis that we've seen thus far at the Open on the women's side? Have there been any standout matches to you? Standout matches? I, when you asked me that question, I didn't automatically go to like one women's match. I think Svitolina and Goff was a really, really good daytime match. Um, also, the night match, actually, with uh, Jing Chen Wen and Donna Vekic was really, really close and kind of featured my favorite style of tennis, which is just hard, flat, and from the baseline. Um, so, yeah, those two stand out. And then, overall, it's just been an entertaining U.S. Open. There have been some flat days, but overall, like I've today. kind of been excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been excited to see how the story unfolds, and we're definitely in the business end. So, yeah. I'm excited. So, okay, first getting into the women's quarterfinal matchups, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to start with the most, probably the most highly anticipated women's quarterfinal match on Tuesday night, and that will be a rematch of this year's Australian Open final between Arena Sabalenka and Kenwin Jane. First, starting with the second seed, Arena Sabalenka, she's been pretty efficient this fortnight thus far. She's only dropped one set in the tournament, and that was two-week Katarina Alexandrova, but otherwise, she's been pretty business-like on court. She beat um, Priscilla Hahn in the opening round three and three, and then Lucia Bronzetti three and four, and then her most recent match was against Elisa Mertens in the fourth round, who she dispatched of two and four. What have you thought about Sal Blanca's tennis thus far in this tournament, Miles? Um, I thought she's looked really solid, um, a little bit more than solid, actually. I feel like I've enjoyed watching her summer from post-Olympics um, to now. It definitely feels like it's gotten gradually better, especially lifting that title in Cincinnati. But there's something about these U.S. Open hard courts and the atmosphere, as she always manages to bring up, that yep. she really that she really likes. The one blip, like you said, was the set she dropped against Alexandrova. And my experience this far in this tournament is to not look too much into blips from top seeds that drop a set. Because there's, like, on the men's side, when Sinner did it, it didn't really seem like that big of a deal. But when Alcaraz did it, it didn't feel like a big deal, but then it turned into be a big deal. So I think mm -hmm. I, I think Sabalenka is more of the Sinner elk this tournament. Like, she dropped that set and got it out of her way against a player that does typically, you know, push her in Alexandrova. But the very next match that she played against Mertens, she was in her rhythm and form and... I expect her to be a tough out uh, in the next round for sure. So she's impressed me. Right. Yeah, she's definitely impressed me too. And she's kind of showed the same form that we saw from her in Cincinnati, which she won leading into the Open. And then really the biggest thing that's impressed me about her is just her clutchness. You know, she showed us like why she is a constant stem contender, especially that comeback against Alexandrova was impressive because the Russian was comprehensively outplaying her in that match. And then I also think we can't overlook her match against Mertens. She saved, I believe, all eight break points that she faced in that match. And that could have been much more um, 
challenging for her. So definitely been impressed by her form. Now her opponent in this quarterfinal, of course, is the number nine or number seven player in the world from China, Kim Wen Jang. She's had a much tougher time on court compared to Arena. And she only had one straight sets match in this tournament. And that was in the in the third round, I believe, against German Julie Niemeyer. But right out the gate, she had a battle on her hands against American Amanda Anisimova, who won Toronto and was a dangerous floater in this tournament for sure. And she also had to come back from a set down the following round against the, the, el- the elder Andreeva's sister, Erica. But she dominated the final two sets there. Um, but then, of course, the best, like you said in the intro, the perhaps the best match of the women's tournament thus far was her last match in the round of 16 against Donna Vekic. That was a rematch of the Olympic final, and it definitely lived up to the hype. It was memorable for not only the quality, but it didn't end until 2.15 a.m. in the morning, and that's the latest finish for a women's match in U.S. Open history. Now, a lot of people were not happy about this late finish. Even Andy Murray, as he loves to do, chimed in on the matter. Um, what are your thoughts on it, Miles? Um, I agree with Andy Murray. I do think that tennis is evolving at a much more rapid pace than like the actual powers that be are keeping up with what to do with that evolution. And they almost seem to brag when players finish past 2 a.m. On one hand, I guess that's fun for them. But then I start to think about the logistics of the fact that like it's not just the players that are affected, like the, the line umpires, the people that do the graphics and stuff on the back end, the commentators, the people that clean up. Everyone is like pushed back and stretched very thin when matches go that deep into the night just to come right back the next day and prepare prepare for the day session even though i'm sure there's some you know shift interchanges and everybody doesn't do the exact same thing every single day it's still tough it's it's a tough turnaround curfews would be great but i guess if you're if you're a night owl like me which i guess is the guilty pleasure of it all i like it i mean i think you brought up some great points about maybe doing a curfew but to be honest it's like what else can you do it's like the matches just go that long it's like not, not like you can stop them if anything maybe try to shorten tennis if possible i think it was you that tweeted it of maybe having at least the first week of the men's side just be best of 3 instead of best of 5 so i think that could be a solution for it for sure but mm-hmm. You know, that's literally the most controversial opinion ever on Twitter on, on in tennis. It's like best of five versus best of three. Mm-hmm. I have no idea why people get so riled up about it. So we're just gonna move on, I guess, from that <laughs> and get it back into the into the match previews. So Arena and Kinwin have played twice, and both of those matches were on hard courts, and Arena won both of those matches in straight sets, and she only dropped five games apiece in those matches. Of course, their previous meeting was at this year's Australian Open Final, which she won 6-3, 6-2, and then they played here in this exact round at the US Open last year, and Sabalenka won it 1-4. and four. And kind of thinking back to their prior matches, Zhang did struggle a bit with being able to kind of match Sabalenka's power from the ground especially initially in their U.S. Open quarterfinal from last year. She kind of adjusted better um, later on. But same thing kind of in their Australian Open final. I think that Sabalenka's power was a little bit too much for Kenwin's forehand, which does have that extreme grip. And sometimes she does tend to kind of shank it a little bit more. So that's definitely something to watch out for in this now matchup. And um, to me, the biggest area I think that Jang struggled at was her returning. She missed far too many returns, especially in that Australian Open final against Sabalenka, especially on her forehand. And actually, she's never broken Sabalenka's serve in their two, um, any of their two matches, if I'm certain. So um, I think that if she wants a chance in this match, she's going to have to make an effort to make more returns. Miles, any thoughts on the, on this matchup? I am intrigued to see how... Chin Win, Jing Chin Win really is able to get into the points because just looking at the previous meeting scores, she was kind of just put off the court. And I think over the past ex- the past month for sure, uh Chin Win is a different player. Like I don't look at her the same way I looked at her um at the Australian Open final, which you know, in the grand scheme of things, is not that long ago. It was eight months ago, but she really has made some strides. I feel like she's smoother on her serve and she does make a little bit more returns. So we'll see if that comes to bear against Sabalenka. If Sabalenka is feeling comfortable in the matchup, she very well may just overpower uh Zheng Chen Wen. That's one of the few people that can really do that on tour. But I'm interested to see how like this confident gold medalist 
Jing Chen Wen goes up against a confident, you know, was Sabalenka world number two? Yeah, world number two, two-time Australian Open champion. Because I feel like in in different ways, they're both different players from when they played in Australia. And the, the court conditions may be a little bit different. So we'll see. If it goes three, I actually give the egg to Sabalenka because Jing Chen Wen has the the miles on her legs from this tournament. But I'm going to, like, as far as predictions, should I give my prediction on who's going to win? Mm-hmm. I picked Sabalenka to win the tournament from the beginning, so I'm going to stick with her. But I think she's going to get through this match in in three. It'll be her toughest match so far, I think. See, I was close to having her win this in three sets as well because the points you mentioned about Kenwin having much more confidence. She really does look like a different player as opposed to when she made her first major final. And definitely that she has that gold medal aura about her. We have to consider the late finish. Even though it was a day rest for her, that still might impact her and mess up her sleep schedule. Sabalenka, she had a late finish too in her match, match against Alexandrova, although that was a few days ago. So I don't think that would be a factor for her. And then as you mentioned, you know, she has that leg strapped up. And as you can see with the graphic, she has over three more hours on court compared to Sabalenka. And I think we can't underestimate that. I definitely do think that though, if Pereriba, her coach, gives her and they come in with a better return strategy of not having to go for as much on her return, maybe chip some some returns in and make Sablanka play. She can for sure, of course, grab a set, but I do think it'll come down to who is just simply the better player in the end. And for me, that's going to be Arena. So I actually have her winning this one in two somewhat comfortable-ish sets. So our first quarterfinal match of Tuesday is between American Emma Navarro and Spain's Paula Badosa. Navarro, she's had a good run to the Elite Eight. She got solid three-set wins over Marta Kostyuk and defending champion Coco Gauff in the last two rounds. And she beat her opening two opponents, Anna Blinkova and Arantxa Rus, one and one in both of those matches. Now, Paula Badosa, meanwhile, she hasn't faced a seed until now, although she did get a good win over our girl Taylor Townsend, unfortunately, in the second round. And before fighting off a match point in her third round against qualifier, remaining qualifier, Elena Gabriela Roos, before winning that one by a score of 4-6-6-1-7-6. She got back on track, though, with a dominant one and two win over Yafan Wong. Now, Bedosa, she won their previous meeting between her and Emma in the Rome second round from this year. She won that one, one six six four six two, And that match was very interesting because Navarro was crushing Bedosa. She had a 6-1, two-love lead over the Spanish woman before Bedosa stormed back. So do you have any thoughts on this match, Miles? This would be their first meeting on the hard courts. I think both of them come into the matchup with different levels of confidence. I think Navarro now having back-to-back quarterfinals at a major, she should start feeling kind of similar to how I'm thinking about her in my head is like, oh, like I'm a real deal threat at these tournaments. Like I'm a, pro- I'm a professional's professional. And that's the way I look at her game. Kind of similar to Pagula, there isn't anything that leaps out from my from my vision when I watch her play, it's like, oh, that is a standout weapon. But she does everything good and she varies up like the pace of the ball with different slices and top spin. It's just it's just everything she does well. And I think she's like I said, she's confident at making back to back quarterfinals with wins over Coco Golf along the way. But then Bedosa mm-hmm. seems to be playing with like this re energized Maybe she's playing for the household of Sitsi Dosa because Sitsi Paz hasn't been bringing in big checks lately. I don't know. But I, it is it is nice to be able to see Paula Badosa get back to the level that she showed at the end of 2021 and 2022. And I'm starting to see that by like how she interjects pace off of or injects pace off of her forehand. Um, she can just like really break a rally wide open with that. And, you know, it's it, her summer has been good. Champion of D.C., semifinalist of uh, Cincinnati. So these are this is a matchup of like two of the best players of the past two months. And I'm interested to see, like, what gives in that matchup. I'm leaning Navarro, but it's going to be a big match for either one of them because neither one of them has been into a Grand Slam semifinal. So that might be an extra element of, like, oh, wait, if they get close to the to the finish line, it's going to be, oh, this is uncharted territory for me. How do I block out the nerves or, you know, deal with the crowd? Because Bedosa was born in New York, and she's been having, like, some good on-court interactions with the crowd and bringing back the Latin flair that she's talked about. And then Navarro is 
obviously United States player. So the crowd isn't backing her like they did in the match against Kostic. So it's going to be interesting to see where they both uh, take their strength from the energy and, uh, I guess, court vibe of the match. I think that's a great point you brought up about the crowd because to me, I wasn't even considering like the whole, the fact that she, obviously she's from or born in New York, but also the whole Latin flair. And we've had players like Beatrice, uh, Beatrice Haddad Maya have the whole Brazilian contingency come out and support her a lot. Um, so for sure, it'd be interesting. I don't think it's definitely, but also a rather face. I think Navarro, as far as the crowd is concerned, as opposed to Coco, because Navarro, Coco is far more popular amongst the New York crowd as opposed to Navarro. So the crowd might not be as big of a factor here in this one. Definitely, as you mentioned, it will be a big match for both as they're both seeking their first semifinal, major semifinal. It's, it's kind of crazy to me that um, Bedosa, she only made one slam quarterfinal prior to this U.S. Open. So definitely, I think there might be a little bit more riding on for her as seeing as she's a little bit older than Navarro, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And Navarro, she's already, like you said also too, she's made back-to-back -back quarterfinals. So she has that relatively recent, fresh like experience of being in a slam quarterfinal as opposed to Bedosa. Her last quarterfinal was at 2021 Rowan Garrow. So it might take her a little bit to adjust to it. And then also too, mm -hmm. this is going to be her first time playing a match on Arthur Ashe Stadium. So her adjusting to that big stadium might be crucial early on for either one of them too. I think the Rome match showed us that there's definitely very little between these two. Low-key, they kind of have similar games. I think the Navarro kind of differentiates herself because of her added variety, I guess. But mm -hmm. Medosa has the edge as far as her returning go. I mean, her serving goes, and maybe also her returning as well. Um, to me, I just think it comes down to who handles the pressure better. I think Bedosa, as you mentioned too, she has a lot of confidence from her summer. Navarro, of course, is not short on confidence herself. I initially was going to have Navarro win this match because of the crowd edge, but mm -hmm. to be honest, I think I'm going to go with Bedosa winning this one in three sets. For one, because I have Bedosa already making the semifinals, so I want to keep keep that going. But I also kind of watching the, the Navarro golf match, in my opinion at least, Navarro, she played well for the first half, but her level kind of dipped. Mm. And we saw the same thing against the Kostuk match. I watched a little bit of that where she started strong, but she dipped. And she was able to kind of control it and get the win towards the end. But I think, honestly, against a more consistent player like a Bedosa, it might not be enough. I genuinely do feel like if it weren't for Coco kind of being off on her serves and return, she would have won that match. I'm, I'm leaning Navarro. I, I think... From what I've gathered about Bedosa, for some reason, I may I may be going too far with this. I may this may mm -hmm. just be something I made up in my head. It seems like she's putting in this effort in tennis as almost like a last stance, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Like like I need to hit it now before my body really quits on me. And sometimes that can kind of create more tension than need be. Whereas Navarro, she's she's been a chill customer like this whole tournament all year really she's been under the radar for everything and i feel like right. I, I i have a sneaky suspicion that's going to carry her through a match that's going to have ebbs and flows of a, of two players going for the best moment of their career thus far so i'm gonna go navarro in three on Wednesday, the big match there will definitely be between 2022 champion Igor Fiontek and the sixth seed Jessica Pagula. Now, neither woman has dropped a set this tournament, and first starting with Iga, she was tested the most actually in her opening round against lucky loser Camilla Rakamova, where she saved three set points in the second set before coming through in that breaker. And actually, since then, it seems like she's been unstoppable. She only dropped one game to Ina Shibahara, who's trying to make a name for herself in singles as well as doubles. And she didn't have, Shibahara didn't have many weapons, so Iga didn't have much trouble with her. And I expected Iga to have definitely more, more problems against her next two seated Russian opponents and Anastasia Pavlyuchenkova and Lyudmila Samsonova, but she handled them pretty easily. She beat Pavlyuchenkova four and, and two and followed by the four and one routing over um, Samsonova. Miles, what are your thoughts on Iga thus far and what you've seen from her? Anything particular that you've noticed from her in this tournament? Yeah, going into the tournament, I realized that like she's definitely not a bad hardcore player, but on hardcore Grand Slams, there are there is some room for improvement because she's only been out of the past now eight hardcore Grand Slams. She's only been past the fourth round twice. 
in Australia 2022 and then winning the U.S. Open in 2022 as well, which are great feats. But th- some of those losses to players like Noskovet at Australia earlier this year, um, Robakin at Australia in 2023, I've just been kind of keeping an eye on her round by round. And from what I've seen so far, I've been I've been really impressed. She's been using a little bit more of her court coverage, especially in the last two rounds against Pavlyuchenkova and Samsonova, where those players kind of go for the corners at will, and that's the bulk of their game style. And I was really impressed with her latest match. I don't know where I've been, but she hit like a 114 mile per hour serve. And for some reason that stuck out to me, I was like, when did she start doing this? I know she retooled her serve at the beginning of the season, but that was another layer that was nice to see as far as uh, aggression and like, you know, taking the initiative from the very first point. So she's going to be tough to beat for sure. And her next opponent, she has a pretty decent record on. So I'm interested to see how that match goes in the quarterfinal. But as far as her form coming in, I I can't lie and say that I haven't been impressed. It's interesting you mentioned the serve. That's one thing I kind of put in my notes. The serve has been a major thing for me. And the commentators mentioned how she hadn't has not faced a single break point actually since the first round of the second set. So that shows you how, yeah, that surprised me too. That shows you how dominant she's been on her serve. And she's been hitting. (laughs) <laughs> I know. <laughs> the main thing is also how she's been able to back up her serve and protect her serve and to where she's not even facing like threats in her service games. That's been very impressive to me, just her efficiency. And it only bleeds into other aspects of her game, like her returning, where she's probably top two um, returning. She might not even be number two. So that's been something I've been noticing from her the most in this tournament. Now, her opponent, Jessica Pagula, she has had a decent run to the quarterfinals. Like Iga, she also has not dropped a set en route to this Elite Eight stage. She beat, or she retired Shelby Rogers, her good friend, before um, taking down another American and Sophia Kennan. That was a really good match, two-set match. So I'm, I was impressed by her being able to come through that one. And then she beat Jessica Buzas Nero. Um, you have to correct me on that pronunciation, unfortunately. So it's Buzas. Jessica Buzas. Mignetto, from what I've gathered, I am not the I am not the pronunciation police, nor am I the CEO of pronunciation. <laughs> Ooh, I, I gotta practice that. It's a tongue twister, low key. Um, and then she had a, probably her most impressive showing was against Princess Dana. <laughs> I'm sorry, Princess Dana Snader, um, who she beat four and two. I'm laughing because of the unseriousness of the nickname. But that was a very good win over her. She beat her four and two. Miles, I know you said you saw that Pagula Schneider match. Anything that caught your eye from that? There were a couple of things. I'll start with the tennis itself, actually. When Pagula is faced up against a player who isn't adjusting well to her rhythm, she can make it look very easy out there. And I think the way she can dictate based off of pers- based off of precision and length is really impressive. And I'm, I'm glad that I kind of woke up to that in her match. Like I was like, oh, I forgot that she can do this when she's playing well. Um, and she really kind of set aside Snyder. I think Snyder was kind of dealing with some fatigue and um, had never really made it that far in a major, I don't believe. So maybe she was dealing with some of those nerves. But I was overall very impressed with Pagula from her serving for the ground stroke. So I think she's going to put up a stern test against Iga, especially considering her two match wins over Iga are on hard courts in Montreal last year and United Cup. So that's something that is going to pique my interest. However, the on-court interview, it's funny how like, People think those are so like un unneeded, I guess, sometimes, but they give me insight and even press conferences sometimes on like what a player is thinking and how they're processing things because they brought up the fact that Pagula has been in many quarterfinals. I think Mary Jo Fernandez did it for ESPN on the on the on the court. And her response made me raise an eyebrow um, in a way because she said that she kind of treats it all the same, just a match. Like if she said that she's going to play, I think Mary Jo Fernandez mentioned she's going to play the uh, Iga potentially. I don't know if she did that or not, but I know she mentioned the quarterfinal thing. And she just kind of, the way she responded made me question or kind of sort of understand why she's currently 0-6 in Grand Slam quarterfinals because she does it, she treats it like any other match. And I, I think there's a pro to that. And I think there is a con because the, the con would be that you don't level up, especially if you're up against somebody that is used to being there and that does that deep in a grand slam. And I think she treats it at any other match so she doesn't like psych herself out, which I also get that would be a pro to kind of 
keep yourself even keel and not get too high or too low. So I'm just interested altogether about like how she shows up in that match against Iga. Very interested, actually. That's a really good point that you bring up there, for sure. I guess looking now into that next match with her and Iga in this quarterfinal, Iga, she has a decent head-to-head over Pagula, leading it 6-3. to three, And they played four times um, last year. I don't think they haven't played yet this year in this season. And they split those four meetings. Pagula, her wins came first in the United Cup where she beat Iga 2-2. Two and two, And then her le- uh, second win, which was her last win, came at the Montreal semifinals, which she won in three sets. Meanwhile, Sviantec... Her win or her latest win over Pagula was a pretty interesting, emphatic one. In fact, she only dropped one game in the WTA year in championships. Now, maybe put an asterisk, not even asterisk to that. I was just about to say, we should put an asterisk on the whole tournament, in my opinion. But, you know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, (laughs) because that whole thing was a mess. Um, It was on a golf course. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the WT, definitely not a highlight for the WTA at all. Um, <laughs> but one one match I don't have in this graphic is their U.S. Open quarterfinal match from mm-hmm. two years ago with Yontech won by a score of 6-3, 7-6, or 7-3. I can't remember. It, might it was definitely a tight, a tight second set. I remember that. And I believe Pagula had chances for sure to take that second set, but she wasn't able to capitalize. I think kind of looking back, at their previous matches in preparation for obviously this preview. The serve, I think, would be huge for Jessica. Pagula needs to back up her first serve well. You know, her last few straight sets lost to Iga, losses to Iga, which obviously including that Cancun loss, but also the Doha final loss from 2023. She won below 50% of her first serve points, which is abysmal. So <laughs> she definitely needs to do a better job of backing up her first serve against such a great returner against Iga. I know some of it is due to Iga's exceptional returning, but if you're not able to hit your spots and win eat decent, easy points, then you're going to have a rough day out there. As you mentioned, the 0-6 quarterfinal record for Pagula will be a, a definitely a notable factor for this one. And Iga has far more experience in actually winning quarterfinals. So she has the edge in that department for, for sure. As far as you know, the positives and the silver lining for Pagula, as she will be still an underdog in this. For one, she's coming into this match with a lot of confidence. She's won her, she's 13 and one in her last 14 matches. She won a title in Toronto and she made the finals of Cincinnati. So she's one of the most red hot players at the moment right now. So she has added confidence and she's been eager before. Um, and then two, I think that Jessica might bring a different challenge to Iga that she has not seen in this tournament thus far. Sviantek's last two opponents, Pavlyuchenkova and Samsonova, they're good ball strikers like Pagula is, but I don't think they have the same consistency from the ground as the American does. So I think that Jesse can challenge Iga a little bit more and Iga having to work hard and not getting as free, easy points as a Samsonova or Pavlyuchenkova uh, gave her. Mm -hmm. I might have it being Sviantek in three sets. I was close to having Pagula win this one, but that was before I saw her match against Samsonova. I think that um, Sviantek's match against Samsonova, I think that her serve definitely impressed me. Like I said, how Iga hasn't faced a challenge like Jesse, Jesse hasn't faced a challenge like Iga, especially on the the return aspects of things. But also the serve, Iga's, as we mentioned too, she's low-key been serve-botting out there. So I think it'll be a different challenge for Jesse for sure. I did have her winning a set due to maybe anticipating a period where Shiontech is off her game as she sometimes in her last few losses, she kind of just goes off the rails. So I could definitely see that happening, but ultimately I do see her kind of pulling it together. I need everyone to like bear with me or maybe buckle in their seats because Uh-oh. I promise I'm not saying this because I don't <laughs> like Igus Biatek. She has done amazing things like on the court and i really have a lot of respect for her so i'm not saying this before anybody's like miles hates he gives me out i don't um because that tends to be the narrative for whatever reason but i am going to go with jessica pagula and it's more so because this is my last stance with Iga with, with uh jessica pagula excuse me i know this is a big hurdle to go to come over this is the world number one and she's lost the world number ones before in quarterfinals so this seems like a large thing for her to overcome but something about the way she played in her match, her last match against Diana Schneider, and I kind of envisioned that match hopefully happening during the day. But I also think they're going to have to really go with the other quarterfinal that might be a day session match too. All of what I'm trying to say is that I feel like Pagula, Pagula's time is right now. 
I know it feels like a like a, a really large mountain with Iga, especially their head to head. Iga's beating her on those very same courts. But if she's never going to like have her moment, then it's not gonna come now. I'll eat crow if she ever gets to another quarterfinal again and wins one. Like I, I I do want her to kind of feel that and get to that level of her career. But I I'm because I've already envisioned like how the points will go. I think I'm going to give it to Pagula in three sets. I know that may sound like very <laughs> like, what are you thinking about Miles? But I think it could, I think it could happen, especially if she plays that Montreal level tennis or brings what she's been playing for the last couple of weeks in Toronto and Cincinnati to the court and, you know, plays as an underdog and Iga maybe might get rattled with the, the crowd. And I think that has a better chance of happening if they play it, at, at night so there's two things if they play at night i think jessica would really do herself a favor by playing into the crowd and if they play during the day which i think might be a little bit of a less of a chance because pagula is from the united states then pagula is going to have to do what she did against diana schneider and like really be precise hitting the ball flat and just taking the time away from Iga. so i'm gonna go with pagula in three this might not age well <laughs> i honestly i know you're trying to like back up or defend the pig but i think that's not outlandish at all pagula it's not like she's um at least oh no i'm not gonna do her like that it's not like she's <laughs> it's not like she's like some like a low-ranked player <laughs> um i love you alicia it's but no like she's she's a top 10 player she has like i mentioned she has a lot of good form coming into this and as you mentioned too she has the full crowd support and it's going to be a night match they're going to be like really rowdy and behind her. I, I, at least I hope, especially with her uh, family owning the bills and whatever. Um, I know Ego, she's gaining the, the popularity of the New York crowd, but I genuinely do feel like I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Pagula um, got the win. I don't think it would be a huge upset for sure. So I just, I saw that to say, Miles, I think you're very valid in your pick for sure. I do think it'll be a headlining upset, though, if Pagula, like, knocks it off for two reasons. Obviously, like, the world number one is out, and I believe that's going to mean there's no former U.S. Open champion in the women's draw once Swiatek uh, is, well, if she's if she leaves or if Pagula beats her or if she doesn't win the title. And then it'll be Pagula in a semifinal for the first time in her career. And I think she's knocking on 30, if not 30 already. Not that that's super old in tennis at all, but... um she has less opportunities, I would believe, obviously, than Iga does to win U.S. Opens and get the semifinals. So I think it'll be a huge victory for her in her career, especially if it's dramatic and three sets and all that stuff, which I kind of want it to be now that we've hyped it up. I'm going to go with Pagula. Don't let me down. And don't wear that dress with the with the cutouts because that's not – don't do that. Wear the one Wear the one she won tonight or one she she won in against Diana Schneider. Wear that one. That's, that's much better. Transitioning to our last quarterfinal match to go over, it, which would be our – probably the first match on on Wednesday between Carolina Muhova and Beatrice Haddad Maya. Muhova will be the clear favorite to me in this one, not just because she leads the head-to-head -head three to nothing against the Brazilian, but she's looked very good all tournament. She hasn't dropped a set, and it's not like she's been beating pushovers. She's beaten the former two-time former champion, Naomi Osaka, in round two, three mm -hmm. and seven, six. And then Anastasia Potapova, a solid top 40 player, four and two, and then arguably the best slam player this year, even though she didn't win a slam, uh, Jasmine Paolini. Yep. She dispatched of her three and three today. So I've been pretty impressed with her. She made the semifinals last year and she was dealing with a lot of injury struggles. So it's really nice to have her back on the stage and playing such great tennis. She's been so smooth. Like every match I've watched of hers, uh, throughout this U.S. Open. I've just been kind of given renewed interest into her career because I not even that long ago, I kind of chopped it up to like, okay, she's going to have the career that a lot of players have had, unfortunately, where like they've had great heights, but unfortunately injuries have just, you know, overtaken their career. But she may be trying to strike while the iron's hot, um, especially given her quarterfinal opponent. Like, I'll get to that later. You, we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, all in all, I think I think Muhova has been playing very good tennis and surprisingly well because her first tournament of the year was Eastbourne. That was three months ago, less right. than three months ago. So to come from like not playing, having surgery on her wrist, and having another prolonged part of her career on the sidelines i'm impressed with just how fluid she looks how engaged and how comfortable she looks relatively early in her comeback so like you said i think she's the the clear favorite and 
might lift the title on the last Saturday. Mm. And speaking of that opponent you you spoke of earlier, of course, it is the Brazilian Beatrice Haddad Maia. I saw the eye roll. Um, she had low key. She's had she had a mid season for much of twenty twenty four, but she. <laughs> but she seems to have turned it around since Cleveland, where she finished runner-up about a week before the Open actually started, a 250 lead-up tournament there. And in this tournament at the Open, she got some solid wins over Elena Avanesian, Anna Kalinskaya, although... Anyways, we can, we can stay there. We can stay there. Have, have you talked about this on your channel? I made a short about it, but yeah, I'm going to talk about it. Okay. And then she... <laughs> she got a win over she, today. She got a win over... Or Monday, she got a win over Caroline Wilsniaki. But I kind of was a little bit shady there with the Colin Sky win because there was a controversial moment in that um, match. Colin Sky was up to love deuce and she hit a shot, a drop shot and it bounced twice really. And, or it was a bump or whatever, but bottom line, uh, <laughs> it, sh it should have been a not up call. And the umpire made a mistake. She, even though she reviewed it on the AR video review system, she decided that it was um, Hadad Maya's point, Hadad Maya's point. And it was really interesting because um, obviously it was very similar to the Jack Draper and Felix Ojeda Aliassime incident in Cincinnati. At least Jack was able to people. And I'm, I'm sure Miles probably thinks this, but I'm sure people have said that Jack was low key. He knew it was a double bounce or whatever. Um, but for Hadash Maya to not even kind of engage and just to walk away as soon as she found out that she won the point, it was definitely a little bit iffy for me. And low key, it, it kind of left a sour taste in my mouth. So. Miles, I know you've been itching at the bit to talk about the talk about the woman. What are your thoughts on the whole situation? You explained that nicely. I don't have much to add, except that that was strike number one of this week. You know what strike number two was? What? As a fellow as a fellow lefty, I took offense to the fact that one, she didn't handle that double bounce thing very well at all. Like it was very clear that she did not get it to it, get to it in time. And then the whole like trying to skedaddle back to the baseline instead of talk through it with the umpire was just not a good look. And on top of that, the match against Wozniacki, like I said, as a fellow lefty that plays tennis, I am so against 55 mile per hour serves. <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw that she put that, like when she won the match on like one of the worst professional serves I've ever seen outside of Sarah Arani, or maybe Coco, never mind, sorry, Coco. Um, I just had to disassociate myself from her because at one point, actually, at the tail end of last year, I was like, oh, I can kind of see Haddad Maya leveling up and maybe like being a consistent top. Like, I didn't think she was going to be top five, but like lower top, lower top 10 to top 15 player. But then like she has some losses like just the other week in Cleveland in the final to McCartney Kessler. All of that combined is part of the reason why I'm not rooting for her. And then the reasons I brought up when we're talking about Mohova is the reasons I think she's going to lose this match rather comfortably. She is a good fighter, though. So like all of that aside, she does fight very well, maybe too much. That's why she didn't want to give Kalinskaya that point. But um, I think Mohova is going to have too much game for her. And especially if she's putting in 65 mile per hour or lower first serves. Yeah, getting into this one, we're not going to, uh, it's going to make it a little bit brief. But for me, I don't want to be mean, but Hadad Maya, Hadaj Maya was low key the biggest sneak in the quarterfinals. Like <laughs> the quarterfinal matchup, like the lineup looks so good. And then you have a Hadaj Maya, and she's an accomplished player. And, you know, I will give her that. She had good form coming into the tournament, making the finals of Cleveland, but she was really aided by the withdrawal of one of Miles's favorite players, Elena Rabakina. But you can't take anything away from her. She won her four matches to get here, so I'll let her have that. But as we see, Muhova, she leads the head-to-head -head with Hadad Maya, three to nothing. Um, their last meeting was at the Cincinnati Open first round in last year, which she won in three sets. So possibly, I think I made an error. I think it was six, seven, six, one, six, four. But anyways, Possibly this one can go the distance here, too. And then also, too, I will give her a little bit more of a bone. I think this is the first lefty opponent that Muhova has played in this tournament. So perhaps that might give her, you know, a little bit of some fits early on in facing such a different opponent. So maybe Hadash Maya can test her there. But simply, I just think it'll come down to who is the better player here. And that's clearly Muhova. So for me, I have Muhova taking this match in two sets. What do you think, Miles? I think Mohova can take it in two sets simply because, as Nene Leakes famously said, you can never win when you play dirty. And Beatrice Adad Maya <laughs> has been playing dirty. So she won't get the win today. Sorry, Beatrice and fellow lefties. <laughs> kind of going over 
our predictions. I had Sabalenka winning in two, in, in two Bedosa winning in three, Shiontek winning in three, and Muhova winning in two. And I do have to admit, some of my reasons behind picking certain players, namely the Bedosa pick, because I was going to have Navarro win. This isn't solely, but it's because I actually had Sabalenka, Bedosa, Shiontek, and Muhova in my semifinals before the tournament started in my preview. Oh, so I, no. I want to remain loyal and I, I want to look good and look better having all four of those into the semifinals. So low key hoping that happens for the most part. I wouldn't be too mad if Pagula won, of course. But um, yeah, and Miles, do you want to reshare your picks for the audience for Christian's crew? Yeah. Hey, Christian's crew. I've enjoyed our uh, predictions panel today, I guess. Oh. <laughs> I went with Sabalenka in three. I think she can navigate that matchup well, especially considering the head to head. And then the following quarterfinal that we talked about, Muhova and Haddad Maya, um, Muhova should take that relatively comfortably. And then Pagula is the one I'm going to try to circle as the upset of the quarterfinals, taking out world number one and former U.S. Open champion Iga Swiatek. And there's one more match. Oh, yeah. Bedosa and Navarro. I'm going to give another nod to an American. I'm not being American biased, I promise. But I think Navarro is going to be too cool for school and make her way through what I envision to be a nervy match because both of those women are playing for something in a round of a Grand Slam we've never been in. So I'm going to go with Navarro. So I guess that is all I have or we have for the U.S. Open Women's Quarterfinals preview and predictions. Y'all know the deal. Subscribe to Miles' channel. Tune into Tennis Miles David and all of his platforms. Tune into Tennis on X slash Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. And also subscribe to me too if you haven't yet already on Christian's Court on this YouTube channel. One, I'm very proud of you for hitting the 20K subscriber mark. Big kudos, big kudos. And thank you for thank sharing you. your platform with me and my uh, very minimal 500 something subscribers, which leads me to my very shameless plug. <laughs> the goal towards the end of the year is to get to at least 1K subscribers. So if you've got okay. to this far, if you've got this far in the video and you've enjoyed half of my takes, go to my YouTube channel and press subscribe. It's completely free. Um, you did it for Christian, do it for me, and we can have a wonderful tennis family. See how that rhymed? <laughs> yep, and I'll make sure, I'll make sure I link to Miles's YouTube channel in both the description and the pinned comment in the YouTube comment. So you have no excuse. Awesome. Go ahead and subscribe to Miles's channel if you are watching to the end of this video. And then also feel free to drop your own uh, predictions in the comments. We will both try to respond to as many as we can. Mm -hmm. um, so for sure, we'll definitely chat it up in the comments and have a nice discussion. So once again, thank you all so much for watching for your support. And I'll see you next time here on Christian's Court.